before we start today's video, I just wanted to let you all know that I now have channel membership, so if that's something that might interest you, please check it out on the channel page. And now, please sit back as we go to mid-19th century USA. Sarah Jane Lothary was born in the year 1833 in the small town of Louisville in St. Lawrence County, New York. Her parents were well-respected members of the local community, and Sarah was the eldest of their four children, a boy and three girls. However, tragedy struck the family as Sarah entered her teenage years. Her mother died in 1844, and her father two years later in 1846. The children then inherited the modest farm, which they wisely rented out, yielding an annual income of approximately $25 each. Sarah was described as being intelligent, and of a lively and cheerful temperament, she was also considered to be quite attractive. In September 1849, she married a local man named Mr. John Gould, but misfortune never seemed to be far away from the poor young lady, and three years later in 1852, he died, leaving Sarah Jane a widow. At the tender age of 19, she had already experienced the loss of both her parents and her husband. Following this, Sarah went to live in the home of her uncle and aunt, who also resided in Louisville. Her uncle, a gentleman named Mr. Danforth Britton, was the owner of a store named Harrison Britton, and also managed a tavern that doubled up as a boarding house. In this supportive environment, Sarah Jane found a semblance of stability amidst the challenges that life had thrust upon her. James E. Eldridge was a young man from a very respectable family, who was also from St. Lawrence County, New York. He was born in 1836 in the town of Canton. However, in 1856, when he was just 20 years old, his family moved to Iowa. James, of course, went with them, but by September of the same year, he decided to return to St. Lawrence County, finding his way back to the familiar surroundings he knew so well. Two months later, in November, he traveled to Louisville, where for some reason, he introduced himself as Mr. Edwin Aldrich. Under this assumed name, the young gentleman obtained a position as a teacher in a local school. Shortly after commencing his position, Mr. Aldrich, as he liked to be known, became acquainted with Mrs. Sarah Jane Gould, and it soon became apparent that he paid her particular attention. Whispers circulated in the community regarding the intentions of this seemingly charming schoolmaster towards the young widow their friendship continued, and at the beginning of March 1857, Mr. Aldrich took a room in the boarding house that was owned by Mr. Britton. It did not take long for Sarah Jane's uncle and aunt to become aware that the young gentleman was expressing romantic intentions towards their niece. A month later, in April, Mr. Aldrich asked Sarah Jane if she would marry him. She excitedly accepted. Subsequently, he respectfully sought her uncle's consent for their union. He presented a sincere and straightforward request, hoping to convey to Mr. Britton his genuine love and commitment for his niece, and to ensure the gentleman that he could be entrusted with Sarah Jane's well-being. Mr. Britton, however, received the news of their engagement with a more measured enthusiasm. Concerned about his niece, he wanted assurance that she would be marrying a genuine hard-working man who had her best interests at heart especially considering the tragedies she had already endured in her 24 years. Mr. Britton questioned Mr. Aldridge about his plans to provide for Sarah Jane. In response, the young man explained that he owned 600 acres of land in Iowa, which was acquired with funds provided by his father. Mr. Aldridge further mentioned a promised additional sum of $1,500 from his father, which he intended to use for purchasing horses. These horses, he claimed, would then be taken to Iowa and sold for a good profit. He would then return to Louisville. While Sarah looked at Mr. Aldrich with complete admiration, Mr. Britton remained somewhat cautious. He wondered if the young man's intentions were sincere, especially given that he had already incurred a small debt at the Harrison Britton store and was behind on his rent. When questioned about this, Mr. Aldrich promised to settle these financial matters once his anticipated funds arrived from the West. However, despite these assurances, Mr. Britton couldn't shake off his apprehensions. Towards the end of April, Mr. Aldrich made a trip to Ogdensburg, a distance of some 30 miles, 
He told people that he needed to go there to sort out some money he was expecting. He was gone for a period of two days. While there, he visited Bell's jewellery store where he was surprised to see an old friend from his school days named Robinson Howe. Curious about Mr. Aldrich's recent endeavours, Mr. Howe inquired about his activities during the winter. However, Mr. Aldrich, known to Mr. Howe by the name Mr. James E. Eldridge, vaguely responded, indicating that he had been busy without specifying his exact pursuits. Mr. Howe asked if he had been teaching, but strangely, the young man replied that he had not. Mr. Aldrich returned to Louisville and continued with the claim that he was expecting a considerable amount of money to soon be arriving from Iowa. In early May, he made another short trip to Ogdensburg. The school was closed for the holidays, so Mr. Aldrich spent most of his time in the company of Mrs. Sarah Jane Gould. They would go on leisurely walks and exchange pleasantries with people they encountered along the way. Mr. Aldrich would often mention his anticipated money coming from Iowa, and Sarah Jane would listen attentively, evidently enchanted by the presence of such a captivating gentleman. However, by now, some people were starting to doubt Mr. Aldrich's story of the supposed money arriving from Iowa. Mr. Jesse Harris was one such person. He was Mr. Britton's brother-in-law and also his partner in the store and tavern. He told Mr. Aldrich that he should pay his debt to them for his lodgings and for the items that he had purchased. Mr. Harris emphasised that he was not disposed to trust him any further without payments. Mr. Aldrich replied that he had already said on many previous occasions that he would pay when the money transfer arrived from his father and that he was expecting it at any time. Not satisfied by the answer, Mr. Harris then told the young man that if full payment was not made by the following day, he would no longer be permitted to stay in the room he was renting. That evening, Mr. Aldrich stayed up late in the company of Sarah Jane. The young lady had started to take a spoonful of Dr. Roger's compound syrup of Livatar each night before she went to bed. She had been suffering a slight cough and the medicine made her feel better. It was now Monday the 25th of May and she took her usual dose, as did Mr. Aldrich and Sarah Jane's sister Helen. The following day, Sarah Jane came down to breakfast to inform her aunt that the medicine had made her quite unwell. Mrs. Britton told her she may feel better after she had eaten and then left the table. She did not see her niece again until half an hour later when she heard cries coming from the woodshed. Upon investigating, Mrs. Britton discovered that Sarah Jane was experiencing severe stomach pains. The young lady then spent the next hour or so lying on the couch in the lounge, occasionally getting up to vomit outside. All this time, she was accompanied by Mr. Aldrich. Mrs. Britton sent for Dr. Gibson, who after a thorough examination, concluded that her distress was caused by an irritation and inflammation of the stomach, and prescribed a few drops of ammonia and anodyne. However, despite this treatment, Sarah Jane's condition showed little sign of improvement throughout the remainder of the day. Mr. Aldrich faithfully remained by her side, diligently attending to her needs by administering her drinks and medicine. She had no fever, but constantly complained of her stomach pains. She told her aunt that Dr. Gibson did not understand her and that she should call another doctor. A few weeks prior to her niece becoming ill, Mrs. Britton found a bottle of arsenic in Mr. Aldrich's room. She had mentioned this to her husband, and although both were surprised as to why he would need such a substance, they did not think any more about it. But now that her niece had become ill, Mrs. Britton felt a sense of unease and decided to check to see if the bottle was still there. To her surprise, it was nowhere to be found. Concerned by this development, she confided in Dr. Gibson, who attempted to reassure her by saying that Mrs. Gould's illness could not be attributed to poisoning he said that in his own professional experience, he had never encountered a case where someone had died from an arsenic overdose. Yet Sarah Jane's discomfort persisted, with Mr. Aldrich by her side throughout. His unwavering care did not go unnoticed by Mrs. Britton, who remarked on his attentiveness to her husband. On Saturday the 30th of May, Sarah Jane relayed a glimmer of hope, announcing that her pain had subsided and expressing optimism that she was on her path to recovery. Grateful for the care she had received, she extended heartfelt thanks to her aunt, her sisters, and Mr. Aldrich. <laughs>
Unfortunately, this optimism was short-lived. Despite her initial sense of improvement, her condition took a sudden and tragic turn later that day. She succumbed to delirium, and that very afternoon, she died. Sarah Jane Gould passed away without having a living father, mother, or husband. Nevertheless, she had found herself surrounded by the comforting presence of devoted relatives and cherished friends. Tears flowed from the eyes of her sorrowful sisters, their grief evident, yet their love unwavering. By her side stood her brother, offering silent strength and support in her time of need. Providing solace and reassurance were her loving uncle and aunt, their tender care, a source of comfort in her final hours. And of course, there was Mr Aldrich, a man to whom she had given her heart, and who in her last moments gave her a final loving embrace. Sarah Jane was buried two days later. The funeral was very well attended, but it was noted that no one displayed a more profound and public expression of grief than Mr Edwin Aldrich, who at every opportunity sought solace in the company of Sarah Jane's sister Helen. However, some present felt that Mr Aldrich's grief appeared forced and unnatural. One mourner remarked that they perceived it to be a sort of dry-eyed mourning. Mr and Mrs Britton were still in shock at the passing of their niece. She had been in such good health and her decline was quite alarming. No post-mortem had taken place. They also observed that Mr Aldrich seemed to be somewhat on edge. However, when Mrs Britton stumbled upon an empty bottle of liverwort tar with white sediment at the bottom in the room where Sarah Jane had died, her suspicions were immediately aroused. She wasted no time in alerting her husband, who promptly took the bottle to a physician in Messina and then to Dr Sherman in Ogdensburg for further analysis. The results were chilling. The sediment was confirmed to be arsenic. Mr Britton returned to Louisville and informed Sarah Jane's brother and two sisters that they suspected that their sister had been poisoned. He also told Mr Aldrich that in order to convince him of his innocence, he needed to show him the bottle of arsenic that Mrs Britton had found in his room. Mr Aldrich, usually a person with a calm disposition, suddenly went pale and seemed to be extremely agitated. He denied that he had ever had any such substance in his possession. Following this, Mr Britton went to the office of County Coroner Ripley and requested a thorough investigation into the circumstances surrounding his niece's untimely demise. On that Saturday afternoon, a jury was assembled for an inquest and the body of Sarah Jane Gould was exhumed. Doctors Ripley, Paddock and Gibson undertook a post-mortem. However, despite their examination, they found no traces of arsenic in the deceased stomach. Lacking the necessary equipment for chemical analysis, they were unable to determine definitively whether such a substance had been present. Nevertheless, during the examination, an unexpected revelation emerged. It was discovered that at the time of her death, the young lady had been approximately eight weeks pregnant. The jury certified the death to be from some cause unknown. The following day, Mr Aldrich was discovered in a state of profound distress. Suffering from vomiting and severe stomach pains, Dr Gibson was urgently summoned and upon examination, he observed a white powder residue at the bottom of the vessel from which Mr Aldrich had been drinking. Despite Mr Aldrich's denial that he had been consuming arsenic, Dr Gibson harboured no doubts regarding the cause of his symptoms. The young man was sick for a few days, but made a full recovery. Speculation began to circulate among the community, with many suspecting that Mr Aldrich had indeed poisoned Sarah Jane. Some believed that he had harboured ulterior motives, possibly driven by his feelings for Sarah Jane's sister Helen. Although the evidence against him appeared circumstantial, the mounting suspicion led to his arrest. In June, Dr Sherman conducted a thorough examination of the deceased's organs at his surgery in Ogdensburg. He found them remarkably well preserved and his tests revealed traces of arsenic which strengthened the case against Mr Aldrich. Consequently, Mr Edwin Aldrich was formally charged with murder. The trial commenced on the 10th of December 1857. Despite the circumstantial nature of the evidence, the prosecution was adept at painting a picture of the defendant's deceitful character. They emphasised to the jury that the man on trial bore the name James E. Eldridge, yet he had presented himself to be an honest citizen of Louisville under the alias of Mr. Edwin Aldrich. The discrepancy served as a poignant reminder 
of a defendant's duplicitous nature. The prosecution laid out the key pieces of evidence in a compelling manner. A chemical analysis of the removed organs conclusively determined that Sarah Jane's death was a result of arsenic poisoning. Furthermore, it was noted that the defendant had access to arsenic prior to the murder, yet none was found in his possession afterwards. His constant presence by Sarah Jane's side, coupled with his own admission of administering medicine to her, no one could deny that he had had the opportunity to give her the poison. Additionally, his absence during the inquest raised suspicions, and his attempted suicide was viewed as an admission of guilt. Collectively, these points formed a formidable case against the defendants. The prosecution also implied that the young man wanted to be rid of Sarah Jane, as she was pregnant, and he wanted to be with her sister. Mr and Mrs Britton, along with Sarah Jane's two sisters and her brother, provided testimony during the trial. Additional witnesses included the Britton's maid, as well as friends of the deceased. Each witness recounted incidents of the defendant's behaviour towards Mrs Gould, and how he appeared to convey to others his apparent devotion to her. Furthermore, testimony was given by all the doctors who had examined the young lady following her untimely death, shedding further light on the circumstances surrounding her demise. The defence questioned the fundamental premise of the charge, while acknowledging that the defendant had indeed been in possession of arsenic. They reminded the jury of Mr Eldridge's entitlements to the presumption of innocence until proven guilty, emphasising that in this case, such proof had not been presented. Mr Myers, the senior counsel for the defence, asserted that two critical questions arose from the case. Was the deceased person poisoned by arsenic, administered by some other person, with felonious intent, and did Mr Eldridge, with such intent, administer arsenic to the deceased? He contended that neither of these questions had been adequately proven. The defence stressed that the doctor who had attended Mrs Gould found no indications of poisoning, and likewise, the post-mortem examination conducted by three physicians revealed no evidence suggesting arsenic as a cause of the young lady's demise. They highlighted a critical detail. Dr Sherman was the sole individual who detected arsenic, a discovery made only after the organs had been removed and stored in a common slot pail. This pail was coated with white lead paint, a substance that often contained arsenic and was secured with a string tied in a bow knot and left unattended between 6 and 10 p.m. under a bed in a room accessible to anyone within Mr Britton's household. It was then transferred to a gentleman's store overnight and then onto a steamboat where it remained in the saloon for six hours during its journey from Louisville to Ogdensburg. Mr Myers further pointed out that upon its arrival at Dr Sherman's office, the pail was stored in an unlocked area and subjected to analysis over a 10-day period. All of this, he argued, could have compromised the integrity of the sample. He quoted from page 56 of Taylor's Medical Jurisprudence, which emphasised the necessity for medical staff to be extremely careful when storing organs, to be sure that none of them can be subjected to any potential tampering. The defence also contested the assertion of Sarah Jane's pregnancy, suggesting inaccuracies amongst doctors' claims. They cited testimony from Anne Lukes, who was a servant girl for the family of Dabforth Britain. She had indicated that the deceased had menstruated a week before her death, therefore discrediting the motive for the crime that had been claimed by the prosecution. On Tuesday the 22nd of December, the judge summed up the case and reminded the jury of the gravity of the decision they would have to make. At half past twelve they retired to deliberate, and returned at 7pm with their verdict. Guilty. The following day the court reconvened, and the judge sentenced the defendant, Mr James E. Eldridge, to death. Despite his situation, he stood by his claim of innocence. His attorneys filed an appeal against the court's decision, which resulted in Judge James granting a stay of execution and approving the request for a retrial. However, the young man's health deteriorated during his confinement, and he succumbed to consumption in Canton Prison, while awaiting the possibility of another day in courts. He was 21 years old. Hello everyone, and thank you so much for listening. As usual, please leave any comments or feedback you may have, 
and I hope to see you all again in the next brief case.